All right. Good morning. How's everybody? All right. If you'll join me in Luke chapter 14, as we consider the four Gospels concurrently, taking them in the chronological order in which the events happened in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. We are now in Luke chapter 14. Last week we were in Jerusalem where Jesus was at the Feast of Dedication, also known as Hanukkah. And there, there was yet another confrontation with the Pharisees. He's left Jerusalem. Now he's gone back down to the area around the Jordan River, and he is invited to a house of one of the chief Pharisees. And As we could well imagine, uh, there's going to be another confrontation with these guys, and we'll read of Jesus rebuking a number of people. Uh, So, Luke 14, verse 1. And it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. So he is back down by the Jordan River where he'd been doing some evangelism, teaching of the kingdom of God, went to Jerusalem for the feast, has come back down to that place. And he and others are invited to a meal at the house of one of the chief Pharisees. And the the Pharisees were wealthy and they were influential. And he's one of the chief Pharisees. So what kind of a house would we expect this to be? It's a big one. It's a big house. can hold a lot of people. And... uh, The Son of God is going to have another confrontation with these people. And we read that it's the Sabbath. So just these two verses, considering the history uh, of Jesus, Jesus, Sabbath, what might you expect to happen? A healing. Exactly. Uh, Do you think the Pharisees are expecting that also? Indeed. In fact, they may have a, a role in it. I'm not sure, but... So far in the ministry of Jesus Christ, there have been recorded in the four Gospels six different healings on the Sabbath. Uh, We had a demon-possessed man in Capernaum, and on the same day, we had Peter's mother-in-law. Then down in Jerusalem, he healed on the Sabbath a paralyzed man there at the pool of Bethesda, and that created quite a stir. Uh, Then back in the Galilee, there was a man with a withered hand that God that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Then back in Jerusalem again, on the southern steps of the temple, uh, he healed a man born blind. And then he went down to the area of Perea, down by the Jordan River, where we are now, and he healed a woman who was stooped over on the Sabbath day. Uh, So the Pharisees are watching him. Uh, They're no doubt asking themselves, will he heal on the Sabbath? Uh, And we have to ask ourselves, is this a trap? Because also present there, in fact, it says before Jesus, is a man with dropsy or uh, edema, I believe is the right way to say that. And uh, edema, according to my Google research, because I'm not at all medically inclined, is an abnormal accumulation of fluids in cells and tissues and and things like that. Uh, So he's standing there. Uh, I wonder, is this man part of a trap that's being laid for the Pharisees? Or perhaps has he heard that Jesus has been invited and he's invited himself to come get healed? We don't know. We'll maybe get some clues as we go along. Verse 3. And Jesus answering, spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go. It says, Jesus answering. Answering. Answering what? Their thoughts. They're not speaking. They're watching. And they're thinking. Is he going to heal again? Jesus is answering their thoughts. That should give them pause about what they're thinking and about what they might be doing. But he answers their thoughts, and I think their thoughts are a question. Will he heal? He answers 
their question with a question. And he asked almost the, the polar opposite of it. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Does the spirit of the law allow the exercise of mercy, helping someone in need of help on the Sabbath day? Is mercy in the heart of the lawgiver? In other words, is what he's asking. And what is the Pharisee's answer? Silence. Silence. If they say, yes, it's lawful to heal on the Sabbath day. Yes, it, the heart of the lawgiver is merciful. If they say yes, what have they done? They've lost their whole reason to try to kill him. On the other hand, if they say, no, it's not lawful to heal on the Sabbath day, what are the people around them going to think about them? You know, how cold, hard-hearted, wicked men they must be. And so they're kind of painted into a corner. Again, Jesus has put a question to them that they won't or cannot answer. Uh, they can't win if they do answer. And such is the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of man. When we approach God based on our wisdom, he and his wisdom will paint us in a corner. And we will have nothing to say. So here we are in this situation. Chief Pharisee's house, big house, lots of people. Uh, movers and shakers have been invited there. And there's a man with a dropsy and Jesus. And we have seen already on display the hearts of the Pharisees with their stone silence and their icy glares, no doubt. And we are seeing the heart of God on display. And Jesus calls this man forward. And, and when, the, when he comes, who sees him? Everybody. Everybody sees him. And he healed him. And it says he let him go. What does that mean? Does that mean he's here against his will because he's part, he's the bait, in fact, of the trap that the Pharisees have laid for Jesus? Or has he not been invited, but he heard Jesus is here and he's come to get healed and now he's free to go? Again, not sure. But we, what we do know for sure in the Gospels, this is the seventh time Jesus has healed on the Sabbath. And it's not going over any more than it has the other times. Verse 5. And he answered them saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again these things. Again, it says Jesus answered. What's he answering? Their thoughts. <laughs> For the second time, he knows what they're saying. Oh my gosh, he did it again. He's a lawbreaker. No, no, it's not lawful to heal on the Sabbath day. But they don't dare say it. But Jesus knows they say it. He, he knows their thoughts. Uh, when he was in this region the last time before going up to Jerusalem, in Luke chapter 13, as we mentioned earlier, he healed this woman stooped over. Uh, and if we go back to Luke chapter 13, and consider verses 15 and 16. Then the Lord answered him, well, verse 14, the woman is healed. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work in them, therefore come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. The rule, if you remember from that study, the ruler of the synagogue is rebuking the people, not addressing Jesus. He's talking to the people. Uh, all you sick people. All you lame and blind people, you can come six days a week and get healed, not on the Sabbath day. Really? And the Lord answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. And that is addressed in the synagogue. The ruler of the synagogue is there. Uh, I guarantee the, the Pharisees in that region either were present or have subsequently heard about that. And now Jesus is addressing them because they're gathered in this house of one of the chief Pharisees. And he again references the animals. 
you know, when he healed the woman stooped over, he said, which one of you would not water your animals on the Sabbath day? And now this time, uh, which one of you, without any hesitation whatsoever, would not help one of your animals on the Sabbath day if it needed your help? Why not a man created in the image of God? Do you care more about your animals? Do you care more about your stuff than you do your fellow man? You know, this is a, a rebuke of the Pharisees. And in verse 4, it says they held their peace. Uh, they would not answer Jesus. But now, here in verse 6, they could not answer his question. Why could they not answer his question? Because if they did, they would be incriminating themselves. They would be, they're pleading the fifth in our parlance. They're pleading the fifth before Jesus Christ. Verse 7. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out of the chief rooms, saying unto them, and let's stop there for a moment. We have a, uh, a change now. The healing on the Sabbath has been addressed. And he's in this significant house of one of the chief Pharisees, and he is taking note of the people who are there and how they're behaving. And what, what are they doing? They're scrambling for the best seats. They're competing to have the, the seats of the greatest honor. And he's taking note of that. And just as the heart of the Pharisees offended him about healing on the Sabbath, the heart of these invited guests offend him also. And so it's a teaching moment. And Jesus never passes up a teaching moment. And he teaches in parables. And so we have one starting in verse 8. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bid thee and him come and say unto thee, Give this man place, and thou be begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at the meat of them. Worship, honor. You'll have honor. Uh, so what is Jesus doing here? He, he, he's watching all the invited guests of this chief Pharisee. And you know the, the guest list are other Pharisees. They're the movers and shakers. Uh, they're, they're prominent people. And they're all competing for the highest space. And so he's rebuking them. He's correcting them. He is instructing them in righteousness. And it is in parable form. And the parable is that of a wedding, which is a much more formal event than a Sabbath meal. Uh, it's a much more high-profile event than a Sabbath meal. And he is telling them, do not, with your presumptuous self-importance, go and take the highest seat. Do not take the highest honor. Because you might get publicly downgraded. There might be someone more honorable than you who is coming to this wedding, and the, the, the one who's hosting it will come to you and say, uh, uh, why don't you come sit down a little lower because this person is more honorable than you. Uh, awkward, right? Very awkward. Humiliating. Embarrassing. And... I guess in my weird way, I think of a television commercial. You know which one I'm talking of? It's what, the 70s or the 80s? It's Bob Euchre. It's a, a beer commercial. But uh, he's, he's told to get out of his seat, and the line is, oh, I must be on the front row. And he's taken up to the very high, furthest row. That's the attitude, the presumptuous self-importance. I must be on the front row. Uh, no, you're in the last row. <laughs> so Jesus said, rather, rather than do that, rather than assume or take for yourself the honor that may not be yours, instead, with a genuine humility, not a false humility, not a 
not a scheme to try to get attention to yourself so that you get publicly upgraded in front of everyone, but with a genuine humility, go take the lowest place. And it may be that the one who invited you would come to you and say, friend, oh, there's a key word, friend. Uh, he didn't come to him before and say, friend, uh, why don't you go sit at the lowest place? Uh, friend, why don't you come up here? Come up higher. And rather than taking the honor, you would be given the honor. And in a wedding, for, for this to happen, uh, to be humiliated would be in front of all the guests. Or to be honored would be in front of all the guests. So do not take the honor for yourself. Go to the lowest spot. And if there's honor to be given, uh, then it will be given. Verse 11. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And here's the lesson of the parable. And it is without exception. Without exception. The proud will be humbled before all. And the humble will be exalted, elevated before all. No exceptions. The lesson is humility. Humility is the mind of Christ. So if you'll join me in Romans chapter 12. This is a lesson in Christ-likeness. Being like Christ. Humility. Romans chapter 12, starting verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I beg you, I plead with you, by the mercies of God, the mercies of God. Uh, see, God is willing to help us that need help. And who needs help? Everybody. Without exception, he is willing to help those who need help by the mercies of God that ye present your body a living sacrifice. If a body is presented as a sacrifice, it's for others. It's not for yourself. You, you would not offer yourself as a sacrifice if it's for you. It's for someone else. That means we must think of ourselves last and not first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Self is last. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's, that's reasonable. Because that's the mind of Christ. That's the heart of God. And be not conformed to this world. We're all grow, we all grow up in the world. We are all educated by the world. And what's one of the things that the world teaches us? Look out for number one. If you don't look out for number one, no one else is gonna. Me first. That needs to change. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. By the renewing of your mind. How does a transformation of our mind, the way we think, how does that happen? The Word of God, Spirit of God, changing how we see, changing how we think. And the Holy Spirit is teaching us to think like Jesus. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to witness of Him. Not only to those who do not believe on him, but even after that, to those who do believe on him. We must learn to think like Jesus. That you may prove, test, show what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And the perfect will of God is to love him first and to love all others next. For I say, verse 3, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought 
to think. And we all do. We all quite naturally, and there's the problem, because sin is our natural state. That is our nature. We all naturally think more highly of ourselves than we should. And the Spirit of God, through the Apostle Paul, is telling us, don't. Don't think more highly of yourselves. Uh, Now, let's slide down to verse 16. It says, be of the same mind. What mind is that? The mind of Christ. And if you want to read the mind of Christ, read Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. The mind of Christ. I have the same mind toward others. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Don't go looking for the high place. Don't go looking for the place of honor. Don't hang out with just the movers and the shakers. Uh, Humble yourself before all. There isn't anyone too low in life that is not worthy of receiving our humility. We should humble ourselves before everybody. Therefore, be not wise in your own conceits. Thinking highly of ourselves, self-conceit, conceit, not wise. That's not the mind of Christ. What is wise? The mind of Christ. Love the Lord your God first. Love all others next. And deny self, self last, in all things, always. The corporate reading this morning in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, humility is the mind and the nature of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, That's not our mind. That's not our nature. So we must take off the old man and put on the new man. He is the new man. The new man, humble. Always humble. Uh, Let's go now to James chapter 4. This is Christianity 101. Uh, Humility, but we all need to hear it repeatedly. James chapter 4. And let's pick it up in verse 6. It says, But he giveth more grace. What is grace? Forgiveness. It's our greatest need to be forgiven of our sin. He giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resists the proud. This is the very polar opposite of Romans 8.31 that says, If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, he is against the proud. He is with the humble. God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Our greatest need to be forgiven of our sin. And there's nothing we can do to earn it. There's nothing we can do to buy it. It must be given. For him to give grace requires humility on the part of the recipient. As as Jeff and I were talking before, and if we say we have no sin, call God a liar. Because God says every man is a sinner and fallen short of the glory of God. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves. What's required for submission? Submission. Humility. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. What's the devil saying to you? Don't humble yourself. Look out for number one. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. God, us, draw near to God. He'll draw near to us. Uh, Who needs who needs to move? Who needs to be changed? Us or God? We need to move. We need to be changed. We need to say, God, you are right. I am wrong. Please have mercy on me, a sinner. Draw near. He will draw near. That's where he wants us. 
is near. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts. How does that happen? The Word of God. Being cleansed by the washing of the Word. Not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind by the Word of God. In the hands of the Holy Spirit. Be afflicted and mourn. Mourn what? The way we are. Our sin nature is offensive to God. We're proud. We do think more highly of ourselves than we should. We are conceited. We should mourn that condition because it does not please God. In fact, Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Be turned, and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. What a promise. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Going back to Luke 14. An eternal truth is in verse 11. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And it doesn't have to be in spectacular ways. Have we all been humbled by God? Uh, when? Generally, when we have been thinking much too highly of ourselves. It's just a very simple, even silly example. I play softball. And some games are good and some games aren't. When the, when the games are good, it's very easy to think, you know, I got this thing down. I'm doing all right. And the next game, humbled. Everything in our life, in the hands of God, can be a humbling experience. Because we are not able... Jesus told us, apart from him, we can do nothing. If we think we got it, if we think we don't need help, then he will show us wrong. He will show us just how much help we need. And when we agree with him and and say, Lord, help me, he helps us. It's his desire to help us. So now, the change of attention. By Jesus, he's going to turn his attention from uh, the, the, those who were there to the one who invited them there. Verse 12. Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. All these guests who are jockeying for the seats of honor, uh, it disturbed Jesus. And so he gave them a, a lesson and a rebuke. And, and now the heart of the one who invited them also disturbs Jesus, and he's going to give him a lesson and him a rebuke. And the lesson is about the motives of hospitality. And what Jesus is saying in his parable is, don't just invite your friends and your brethren, which in their in the context here would be the other Pharisees. Uh, don't just invite your family and your rich neighbors, who probably have something that you're coveting. Uh, just don't invite those who can repay you in kind later. Instead, invite or also invite perhaps the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, the social outcast, the social downcast, the social undesirable. I don't think... And it doesn't matter uh, what I think. I don't think the Pharisees invited this man with a dropsy because he's completely undesirable. But 
for whatever reason, he was there and he was healed. Uh, what the Lord is telling the, the host and therefore all those who are listening, and that would be everybody, uh, the motives for hospitality are important. Examine your motives. Don't give hospitality in order to get. In fact, don't give, period. Don't give anything. Don't give in order to get. That's man's heart. Instead, give with God's heart. And God's heart is to give to bless, not expecting anything in return. Don't ask people to come over to your house for dinner thinking that some in, in return they're going to ask you over to their house for dinner. No, no. Ask someone over to your house for dinner that can't pay in kind. And Jesus says, God will reward you personally, personally in the age to come. Because who does God invite to his house? Uh, all those people in verse 13. The poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Uh, and who is that? That's all of mankind. From God's perspective, that's all of mankind. And he has invited all. And so when we give hospitality with man's heart, what we will get is probably near term and in kind. But if we give hospitality with God's heart, we may not get anything near term, but we'll get something awesome long term. A deferred repayment, if you will, is much better given the one who is going to give in kind. Uh, so we read, we read this rebuke to the chief Pharisee in whom how, who's in his house are all these people. And Jesus says, don't invite these people, invite those people. And we read that, and, and what's our reaction? Ouch. Ouch. Because we're like the chief Pharisee. We invite our friends. We invite our family. We don't invite people who are outcast or downcast or undesirable. And we realize it stares us right in the face. Not only is the host being confronted, we are being confronted in this passage. Because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And this is one of those things that shows it to us plainly. And it leads us to a place of, oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, help me. Lord, change me. Verse 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. So someone there, don't say who, someone there has heard the righteous rebukes of Jesus to the Pharisees regarding the healing on the Sabbath, to all the invited guests for their scrambling for the best seats, and to the, the host for his invitation list. After hearing these righteous rebukes from Jesus, this guy says, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Oh, how wonderful it's going to be in the kingdom of God. And that serves as a springboard for Jesus to take because it presents a, a teaching moment. He never passes up a teaching moment to offer another parable about the kingdom of God. Verse 16. Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. This is a parable. It's speaking of a, a truth that if you believe it, you will understand it. If you don't believe it, you will not understand it. Uh, so in the parable, uh, a certain man. Who's the certain man? God the Father. Uh, he's made a great supper, a feast, a celebration. Where? His house. And he bade many. He invited many. In the context is this particular feast, and it's filled with Pharisees and movers and shakers. 
and all the important people. He invited many. And it says he sent his servant. Who is the servant? Jesus. Jesus is the servant. And he sent them, he sent his servant at supper time. When is supper time? At the appointed time. It was listed on the invitation. This is the supper time. So he sent his servant at the appointed time, essentially with a reminder. Come, everything's ready now. Now is the time. Verse 18. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I must go prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Invitations given. Servant follows with a, a reminder saying, now, now is the time. Let's go. Uh, and with one accord, those who were invited rejected the invitation. And they offer up a bunch of lame excuses as to why they can't come, won't come. The first one is, I just bought some land and I have to go see it. What? Really? I mean, like right now? How lame is that? Uh, he's telling the servant of the master of the house that I'm too busy. I have no time for this God stuff that you're talking about. His excuse is earthly business. The next one says, you know, I just bought oxen and I have to prove them. I have to test them. I got to give them a test run in my field. What? Really? I mean, like right now? And what he's saying to the servant of the master of the house is, you know, my stuff is more important than God's stuff. And his excuse is worldly possessions, worldly pleasures. Then the third guy says, I'm married. So? So? This is not a call to arms. Remember back in Deuteronomy 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 24, if the Lord tells him, when you go into the land, it's time to go to battle. Uh, if someone has just taken a wife, he doesn't have to go. Let him spend the first year with his wife, and then he can go. This is not a call to arms. This is a call to a celebration, to a feast. Well, I'm married. So? so? What he's saying to the servant of the master of the house is, my wife is more important than God. And his excuse is an earthly relationship, a social relationship. Verse 21. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. The servant reports back to the master of the house. The servant is Jesus. He reports back to the Lord the Father. And he shares all the lame excuses that he heard as to why they're not coming. And the Father is angry. So he sends, instructs his servant, his son, to go near. To go into the streets of the city. Go near and invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, those that we read about in verse 13. Uh, go in the, in the mind of those who were invited uh, to invite the, the maim and the poor and the lame and the blind is to invite publicans and sinners. And the servant says, it's done. We've done that. And there's still room. See, Jesus has been preaching the kingdom of God is at hand for coming on three years now. The Pharisees hate him. They want him dead. 
Those who are the poor and the maimed, the lame and the blind who have been touched by him and healed by him are responding. But Jesus is saying to the Father, there's still room. You still got room in your house. So verse 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. First of all, the Lord wants a full house. He doesn't want a, a, a half filled house. He doesn't want a mostly filled house. He wants a full house. And so go far. You went near. Okay. Now go far and urge, persuade, constrain whosoever will come, whosoever will come. And who are the people who are afar off? Uh, you and me, Gentiles. See, the father sent his son to the lost sheep of Israel. But he was not received by them. The gospel is to the Jew and to the Gentile. God is the God of the Jews and the Gentiles. Promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the servant was sent to Israel. And they were near. And most of them had lame excuses as to why I will not be governed by this man. He is not the Messiah, the King. I'm out. Gospel went to the Gentiles. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, starting verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time Ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both, both Jews and Gentiles, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, his body the body of Christ, the church, one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. The gospel to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, but it's for the Jew and the Gentile. And the body of Christ, the church, is made up of Jew and Gentile, to those who are near and to those who are far off. To those who are near, most had lame excuses. Some responded because they were poor and they were maimed and they were lame and they were blind and they were touched by Jesus. And they responded. But there was room. Lots of room left. So go far and fill my house. And someone came and told each one of us, who Jesus is and how much he loved us and what he did to reconcile us to God. Someone came and told us that. And we were drawn by that love. We were drawn by that grace. And we may have wrestled with it for a while, but at some point in time, we agreed. We confessed our sin. We repented of our sin. We were given newness of life, and now we're part of that body. Because someone cared enough to tell us. But there are still people afar off that haven't heard. Who, who goes? Who's to go there? Us. And the message to draw is God's love and God's grace. Verse 24. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Remember, in the context of the parable about the kingdom of God, many people were invited. 
But they all had these lame excuses. Well, then go near. That's the, the Jews. And go far. That's the Gentiles. Well, then who are the men who were invited in the context of Jesus' parable to the people present at that meal? Ah, the people present at that meal. They were the ones present, and they're the ones with the excuses as to why Jesus of Nazareth is not the Messiah. And we're not following him. Jesus concludes his parable by saying that the master's judgment of them who were invited but offered lame excuses why they would not come is that they will not eat bread in the kingdom of God. That which they thought was theirs by birthright, the kingdom of God, they're not included because they would not come when all things were ready. On the other hand, the master's judgment for all those undesirables, the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, near and far, his judgment of all those undesirables who did respond and accept the invitation to receive his help, to receive his grace, is the kingdom of God. So in this passage of Scripture, in Luke chapter 14, there are four very pointed lessons for all of us. The first one has to do with being self-righteous and legalistic. Jesus healed on the Sabbath. The self-righteous Pharisee said it is not lawful to do that. He is breaking the law. They had no mercy, even though the lawgiver delights in mercy. Beware self-righteousness. Beware legalism. It's very upsetting <laughs> to the Lord. The second lesson is about humility, the mind of Christ. And we're instructed to not be self-seeking, to not be self-important, to not be presumptuous and arrogant and self-righteous and to not be falsely humble, but rather to genuinely be humble, to love the Lord first, all others next, and ourselves very last. We're taught to be self-last, the mind of Christ. And the, the third rebuke, therefore, the, the third lesson also has to do with humility. It's the heart of God. Don't give in order to get, but give in order to bless, not expecting anything in return. That's the heart of God. And the fourth lesson is about the kingdom of God. Who gets an invitation? Everybody. When you receive the invitation, don't reject it with some lame excuse. And from God's perspective, what is a lame excuse? Every excuse is lame. <laughs> if you get the invitation to come because all things are now ready, don't reject it. Take it. And don't Say, okay, I'll do it, but I'll do it later. Don't wait. Because now is the time of salvation. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. None of us are even guaranteed dinner time tonight. Now is the time of salvation. And so when we get the invitation to the kingdom of God, grab it. Hold on to it. Don't let go of it. Be thankful. Rejoice that it's been offered and be uh, eager to accept it. Don't try to wrestle with, well, how could God love me before you take the invitation? Because be comforted and be encouraged that God loves sinners. He loves the poor, the maim, the blind, the lame, all of those spiritual undesirable sinners. We're all sinners. God loves us. He hates the things that we do. He hates our nature. So he sent his son to bear the sin and his wrath for all of those sins 
that by grace through faith we might receive His nature. God loves the sinners. We should be comforted by that. And we should be changed by His love and by His grace. And we should be motivated to put feet to it and leave here and go share that good news with someone. Someone loved us enough to give us an invitation to the kingdom of God. We have lots of people in our lives. Every last one of us have a lot of people in our lives, close or far, at home or at work or whatever. We have a lot of people who have not accepted the invitation. But they still have breath, so there's still time. We should love them as someone loved us and tell them about the love and the grace of their Creator. Because now is the day of salvation. Time is short. May the love of Christ constrain us, urge us, persuade us that if you love me, you love that person. Lord, give me the boldness. Give me the power of the Spirit to tell that person how much you love them. May I do it with fear and trembling because I am really no different than that person. We all fall short of the glory of God. May I not have an attitude of I'm holier than you. Lord, keep me humble. Keep me meek. Give me the words. Give me the power. And save that person. Where are the preachers? The preacher doesn't stand here. A preacher stands there, but there's the preachers. Amen? So stand with me. And those who are going to Israel would also come up here. We will uh, lay hands on. And Keith and Cheryl and and all y'all who want to, whoever, whosoever wants to lay hands on them, please come forward. Well, I'll, I'll hold on to, I'll hold on to these guys. <laughs> okay, Father, we come before you in Jesus' name, his righteousness. His authority. We have no righteousness. We have no authority. We come in the name of the Son who is well-pleasing to you. We ask that you would anoint those of us who are going to Israel, that you would open up scriptures as they've never been opened up before, that we may see your will, your ways, your nature, that we might see your land and your people that we would be blessed, that we would even be shocked on occasion by the things that we see. And I pray also, Father, that we just not go be silent tourists, silent pilgrims, but we would go as ambassadors of Christ. That the love that you have for those people, you call them the apple of your eye. You have made promises that you will faithfully keep to the very last letter. May we be your ambassadors of your love and your grace and your mercy. Father, give us opportunities to talk about Jesus. Give us boldness to share the Jewish Messiah with the Jewish people. And may all those who are not going this time, may you speak to them about perhaps going another time. But in the meantime, may you send them into their homes and into their workplaces with the gospel and a love for the people that you bring across their path. May the invitations be given and may they be accepted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.